Hi students, welcome to Year 12 Chemistry and Module 5, Equilibrium and Acid Reactions. This is video number 14 and we're going to be looking at determining the equilibrium constant experimentally. Well, of course, I'm not actually going to experimentally determine it, but I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the things that you might do and some of the implications of seeking to determine the equilibrium constant experimentally. So one of the things that we need to look at when we're uh, considering experiments and how we might determine an equilibrium constant is to look at the um, states in which each of our species uh, exists at standard laboratory conditions. And the assumption we're going to make is that each of these uh, uh, reactions are being carried out at uh, standard laboratory conditions 25 degrees Celsius or 298 Kelvin. So the first thing that we look at is the fact that the first example that I have for you, which is calcium carbonate decomposing into calcium oxide and carbon dioxide, is an example of what we call a heterogeneous equilibrium. This is a reaction that uh, we look at often as a completion reaction. Um, one of the reasons, of course, that we can't reform the a reactant from the products is that the carbon dioxide is a gas and often we carry this experiment out in an open system uh, a test tube or even sometimes we might bubble the carbon dioxide into some lime water to test for its presence and of course that removes it from the system and therefore uh, prevents uh, the reverse reaction from occurring if we were to look at the equilibrium constant for this reaction and say this is a concentration of products over reactants, so the concentration of calcium oxide multiplied by the concentration of carbon dioxide and then divided by the concentration of calcium carbonate, what we notice when we do this is that um, firstly the reactants are a solid and therefore we can't really talk about changing concentration of a solid if you have twice as much solid it will take up twice as much volume and therefore based on its density that value will not change so this value here is a constant so we just remove that um, at this stage this value is also a constant so the calcium oxide, like the calcium carbonate, is going to uh, also be able to be removed from this particular expression because, again, being a solid, uh, an increased amount will take up a larger space and therefore there will be no change uh, in its concentration. So therefore, for this particular reaction, the equilibrium constant is defined by the concentration of the carbon dioxide gas. If there's a way that we can identify the volume of the container and the amount of um, carbon dioxide that is produced, then we can work out what the equilibrium constant is. In the second example, we have water liquid um, being converted uh, into water gas. When we write an equilibrium constant for this particular expression, again, uh, it would be the products, which is the uh, gaseous version of water, divided by the reactants, which is the liquid version of water. And once again, because of its density, this uh, liquid version would disappear from this equation. And so the equilibrium constant would be um, uh, expressed simply as the concentration of the gaseous uh, water. Both these first two examples are examples of heterogeneous equilibrium, but the third one is a homogeneous equilibrium. So this time all species are gases. So therefore, when we work out our equilibrium expression, we can work it out on the basis of our uh, nitrogen dioxide being raised to the power of two uh, divided by uh, nitrous oxide raised to the power of two multiplied by uh, concentration of oxygen. Now, what we've done with each of these three equations is we've worked out the equilibrium expression, but does that mean we can actually experimentally determine any of these particular uh, systems? Well, they're not easy. Being able to determine the number of moles of gases is really only possible by looking at the volume of those gases and using uh, the uh, ratio of molar volumes um, by determining how much of a particular uh, mole or how many moles of a particular gas is being produced in a reaction and so on. So some of these, particularly um, these equilibria involving gases, are difficult to deal with. 
But what about equilibria involving ions? So there is a technique, uh, the technique of colorimetry, which allows us to determine the concentration of colored ions in a solution. So therefore, if we think about uh, one equilibrium that we could actually investigate uh, in a meaningful way would be a uh, solid, which is dissolved in uh, a liquid in water to form a solution. We know that there will be particles of the solid that are entering the solution. We also know that there will be ions in the solution that will be precipitating out to reform the solid. When these two processes are, are occurring at uh, the same rate, then we have an equilibrium. And this occurs in a saturated solution for any ion. So uh, we've talked about examples where we might have something like um, sodium chloride and the sodium ions are going to uh, combine with chloride ions in the solution to form a sodium chloride salt solid. And likewise, the sodium chloride is going to um, ionize or, or dissociate into ions in the solution. But sodium chloride is not a colored solution. And in order for the um, uh, process of colorimetry to work, we need the ions in the solution to absorb light of particular wavelengths. And then for the uh, proportions, when the proportions of ions is higher, then um, there will be a greater level of absorbance and we can um, digitally convert those differences into a display that allows us to make comparisons um, of the various concentrations. So sodium, not a particularly good example to choose because of the fact that it is colorless. Maybe something more like copper, which we know has a nice blue colored solution is a better choice for this particular technique. The key, of course, is that there are uh, specific wavelengths, some of which are in the visible part of the spectrum that can be absorbed by the ions. And as a result, uh, will change the intensity of light that's actually uh, picked up by a detector in the colorimeter. So um, this process usually involves the setting up of a, a calibration curve in order to compare known concentrations and then to set up a curve where we can measure an absorbance and extrapolate or interpolate back to uh, the concentration. Hopefully this is a technique you'll have a chance to have a look at in class. Good luck and thanks for watching.